speaker was one of only three Australian women to win an individual Olympic gold medal at the Sydney 2000 Olympics, Cathy Freeman and Susie O'Neill being the other two. Her amazing performance at the Sydney Games was achieved against the odds with an enormous amount of hard work, perseverance and teamwork. Lauren Burns is a 12-time Australian national taekwondo champion and has competed internationally, internationally for over seven years. She won medals at the World Championships in 1996 and 1997 and won gold in the US Open in 1999. But the crowning glory was undoubtedly her Olympic victory in the under 49 kilogram class. Please welcome Lauren Burns. To be an Olympic gold medalist or to be a world champion or to be at the top of your field in sport or really in any endeavour that you had to be a child prodigy. You had to start when you were two and a half years old and have crazy fanatical parents throwing tennis balls at you in your high chair and you know absolutely start at some incredible age and so I guess as I was growing up I'd always loved the Olympics but I, I didn't think that I could ever achieve that sort of success and I didn't start Taekwondo until I was 14. And the only reason that I started was because my brother started. And he was seven at the time. And like most little boys his age, in the mid-80s, he fancied himself as a bit of a teenage mutant ninja turtle. And I think they're coming back, actually. And he was obsessed with the ninja turtles. He had a little ninja outfit that his friend's mum had made him, a headband, the whole thing. And he, he loved Donatello. Donatello was his favourite. And we used to have to call him Donatello, otherwise he wouldn't answer to us. So, you know, you'd say, what do you want for breakfast, Donatello? And it didn't matter what he had. He could have had a piece of toast, bowl of cornflakes, but as long as he sat there going, pizza, Twah! you know, that was okay. So that was fine. And he particularly loved doing flying sidekicks off the couch. So he would, you know, pile up all the cushions and he'd jump off and you'd hear him, you know, for hours yelling and screaming. And that was fine. And we encouraged his creativity and his enthusiasm. And then this one day, we were all at home and it was just on the weekend and as usual, Mike, my brother, is, you know, jumping off, Donatello, I should say, jumping off the couch and all of a sudden we hear this, hi smash! And he just went straight through the lounge room window. <laughs> and that was it. We came rushing over. There's my brother. He's still got the headband on lying there like this. And for my mum, that was really the final straw and she said, that's it. Donatello is going straight down to the local martial arts club. So... She didn't care what that was, could have been taekwondo, judo, karate, whatever, as long as he was in some sort of safe environment. 
controlled environment. So luckily there was a Taekwondo centre just in the next street to us and my brother joined. Absolutely loved it. Then my dad joined and the two of them would go down together and I just always thought they looked so gorgeous, you know, both in their little white pyjamas and their little belts and dad had bought them identical training bags with identical protectors in them and their identical drink bottle and they'd walk down the street and I just thought that's, you know, that's wonderful. But I never really thought about getting involved until finally they convinced me to go along and try a session. And I'd always thought it was important, particularly for women, to learn self-defence, but I'd never really known where to go. So joined the class, went a couple of times. To my surprise, there was girls my age. And like I said, I was, you know, 14. And I just really enjoyed it, but I didn't take it all that seriously. And then this one night, I'd been doing it for a couple of years, and I was standing there, it was a Tuesday night, and my instructor read out a list of people that he'd already entered in the Victorian Championships that were coming up that weekend on the Sunday. And I thought, I didn't even know there was a sports side of Taekwondo. I didn't know they even had competitions. I'd never been in one before. I'd never even been to one. But I thought, if he's entered me in this tournament, he thinks I'm good enough, that's fine. Sure, I'll go in this tournament. Now, like I said, I'm 16. My social life is absolutely paramount. I had a party to go to the night before, which I wasn't going to miss out on. Went to the party, rocked up at the Coburg Town Hall in Melbourne with mum and dad and my brother. And I walked in and I'd never seen anything like it. This incredible cacophony of sporting sounds. I don't know if any of you here have ever done martial arts or been to a tournament, but it can be pretty loud. And they had six courts all running at the one, one time and people yelling and screaming. And they didn't used to cordon off the area around the ring. So they had all the spectators, friends, family, all gathered around the ring cheering for their player. And my mum took one look at this scene and she just said, Lauren, there's no way you're competing. Have a look at these people. They're crazy. They're aggressive. They're violent. They're trying to kick each other. They're yelling. There's just no way you're getting out there. Now, my mum is from a classical ballet background, so her idea of competition was a little bit different to what was going on in this room. And like a typical teenager, I told her to go and sit right up the back. And finally, I went out and competed against this girl. And I'd waited all day. And this other girl and I were so evenly matched. You know, we're the same height, same weight. You know, we even looked almost similar. And just before we went out, I had this incredible fear. And the fear was that I would get in the ring, the fight would start, and I wouldn't be able to move. My legs just felt so heavy. I thought, I'm going to get out there. I'm not even going to be able to lift my legs for one kick. I was just gripped with fear. But suddenly, my instructor's pushing me in the ring. The referee starts the fight. And the opposite happens, and I can't stop kicking. And I'm going for it, like these arms and legs are going everywhere, and I'm kicking, kicking. She's doing the same thing, we're both kicking like this. Neither of us are touching each other, so neither of us are scoring. <laughs> and within the first 30 seconds, we're leaning on each other, and then we'd kick again and lean on each other. It was really pretty tragic, actually. But in the last round, we still had, there was no score, and she does this kick, and it comes up, and it just clips my face. And I'd never taken a kick to the face before. I had a mouth gout in, but I could just taste a little bit of blood in my mouth. Now, it was a tiny little nick, but I didn't know that at the time. All I could think about was the blood. So I'm just frozen. I'm standing there. I'm just thinking about, oh, my God, my teeth, my mouth, the blood. It's all I can think about, the blood, the blood, the blood. The referee's standing there giving me the eight count to make sure I'm OK. The first thing I see out of the corner of my eye is my mum. And she's burning down the stairs and she's going, go Lauren, smash her, kick her in the head. <laughs> and she yelled and yelled and yelled for the entire rest of the fight. And that was it. I walked away and I thought, that has to be the most stupid sport I've ever been involved in. <laughs> Firstly, I've got this girl who's trying to kick me in the head as hard as she can, and that's one of the aims. And secondly, the reaction of my mother. I'm so embarrassed, I'm never coming back. So that was it for me. I retired from Taekwondo that day. And... Uh, it wasn't until later on that evening that I started to think about it. And I thought about that girl, and I thought about me, and I thought, gee, neither of us really had any idea what we were doing. We were both equally as bad as each other. So I made it my goal that night that I was going to train, I was going to get a little bit better, and I was going to beat that girl the next Victorian Championships, and then I would retire. So I got together with a friend of mine at the club, and I believe that success leaves clues. And if someone's doing something that they're successful in, then they're obviously doing something right. And even if you can learn just one thing from that person, then it's worth it. 
So we went around to all different you know, clubs and championships and whoever was being successful or made a national team, we asked them what they were doing. Created our own training program, which I'm sure you can imagine how dangerous that is. So whatever anybody else was doing, we put into our programs. Running, stair training, sprints, plyometrics, all the taekwondo drills, we did absolutely everything. Totally overtrained and did many stupid things and luckily I found a strength and conditioning coach not long after that who put me on the right track. But that was a real turning point for me because I never saw that girl ever again. And, but I did win the next Victorian Championships and made my first team in 1993. But when I look back at that time, it taught me something really important. It gave me an understanding of, of what it was going to take to be an athlete. And I learnt something then that I apply to every area of my life, and that is that you don't have to be the best at something. You don't have to be the most talented, you know, have that natural talent, but you have to be the most determined. And if you have determination and you mix it with passion, and excitement and a love for what you do, then you can do anything. And I see people all the time, and I'm sure you, you, know, you know people, whether it's you know, family or you know, other people at school or you know, friends that you know, that have that natural talent. You know, they have this just natural ability. And I see kids all the time at the club, and I think, man, you know, they're going to go a long way. But it's not always those people that achieve the high accolades or reach that sort of success. You know, it's the ones that have that spark that enthusiasm about what they're doing and they're not afraid to put in the hard work. And I guess hard work and determination is a big part of any athlete's career. And I have to say one of the hardest things that I've ever done in my Taekwondo career was dieting for the women's under 49 kilo class. Now, just to give you an idea of why I had to do that, I weigh about 55 kilos now. That's my natural, healthy, you know, not training seven hours a day kind of weight. When I was training for the Olympics, I was training about seven hours a day, and even all of my international career, I would drop into the under 51 kilo class. Now, that was my fighting weight, and it was safe for me to do that, but it was still challenging. But for the Olympics, they didn't have the usual eight weight divisions, they only had four. So my option was either to go in the under 49 kilo class, or go up and fight in the under 57 kilo class. Now those 57 kilo girls aren't 57, they're about 62, 64, some of them are about this tall, <laughs> legs up to here, it's a totally different game plan. So we decided, you know, with me and my coach and nutritionist and help of, you know, all the different people around me that 49 was going to be the best, you know, most competitive weight division for me. Now, mind you, they couldn't just put me in a plastic bag, <laughs> chuck me in the sauna, drag me out, plonk me on the scales and expect me to fight, you know, the biggest fights of my entire life. You know, I had to have speed, power, decision-making time. You know, it's like if you don't, you skip a few meals or you don't drink enough water throughout the day, you know, you're just not quite as sharp. So I couldn't afford to compromise any of that. So it took me three months to do and I did it really, really well. I had to make sure that everything was right. When I was at home in Melbourne, it was a little bit easier because I could just, you know, strip my pantry and my fridge of anything I didn't want to eat, pack it full of fresh fruit and vegetables and all the things I could have in abundance. And when I got to the village though, it was just that final two weeks and I was right at the very end of that two week period. And once I got there and I saw the dining hall, <laughs> I was absolutely shattered. It was just enormous the size of a football field and filled with every different type of food you could possibly imagine. Now they're catering for athletes of all nationalities and all shapes and sizes. So there's this incredible sense of abundance and they've got Japanese food, Mexican, Italian, they've got big bins of streets ice creams. They've got a McDonald's inside the dining hall. Now for someone who's dieting, especially at that point, I was so close, that is like a torture hall. <laughs> 